All right, well, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks very much for coming on such a beautiful day. It's not really the best day to be indoors. Uh, and there's so many festivities and uh, happenings happening in around Melbourne at the moment. So um, I'm really honoured that everybody's chosen to come and spend a couple of hours here with us. Uh, of course, we've got some really exciting uh, topics uh, coming up today. But before we get started, I'd like to uh, respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, uh, the Wurundjeri and Woiwurrung uh, and Boonwurrung Boon Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, uh, and acknowledge that these lands were never ceded. Um, all right. So the run of the day is uh, we've, so we've got two main uh, two main sec sections. We've got first of all uh, the topic of the intersection between psi and UFO phenomena with Paul Dean. Uh, I'll be introducing him in a little bit more detail later. That's going to go for about an hour. We'll have 45 minutes of talk and then 15 minutes for questions and answers. Then we'll have like a 25-minute break. Uh, so that's an opportunity to have a look in the bookshop or go and um, make use of the tea and coffee facilities and mingle around and meet some of the other cool people here. Uh, then we're going to get back together again. And uh, the second session is, with, is being headed up by um, George uh, together with David and Maureen. Uh, around uh, automatic writing and xenoglossy, a real-life example. Uh, so that's very exciting. So uh, without any further um, ado, I'd like to introduce to you Paul Dean. Uh, Paul Dean is a, a, a UFO historian and researcher with 25 years' experience. He has encyclopedic knowledge of UFO cases uh, from around the world and throughout uh, history. His specific little niche of specialisation within uh, UFO investigation is in uncover, is it using the Freedom of Information Act to uncover uh, declassified government and military documents from around the world. He has a collection of about 180,000 documents, which uh, is a lot of reading to do, but when uh, Paul finds uh, new cases that have not been brought to light yet, then he publishes on his website. I'd like to welcome Paul Dean to the stage. Thank you. So, um, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, this is going to move pretty quickly. So, what I study essentially is, uh, everyone's heard the term UFO, unidentified flying object. And it can mean, I mean, it means just that. Um, if you have, if you're an air traffic controller or a combat pilot or just a regular boob on the street and you see something in the sky that is... Very, very hard to explain. Something maybe you've never seen before. Um, it, it becomes an unidentified flying object. What I'm interested in is cases where, after really significant investigation, all mundane, normal things can be ruled out. Meteorological phenomena, planets and stars, um, uh, right down to fireworks, rockets, lenticular clouds. Um, then you've got what we call a true UFO case on your hands. What my in, where my interest truly lies, though, is particularly since the 40s, what what government agencies, be they military commands like armies, air forces, navies, um, uh, intelligence community officers, law enforcement officers, what have they been sitting on? that the public simply has no idea about, OK? So um, raw data, opinion pieces from within military commands, um, that's where my interest lies. And sometimes, in a very short period, of, it's very, very hard to discuss UFOs in a very short period of time. I would never try and convince anyone of the reality or non-reality of UFOs or what it maybe all means and when it started and where it's going and stuff. But what I can do, sometimes I, I will do, is read out some of the most famous quotes um, ever written about the US, U, UFO topic in the last, since, say, 1947. I'll read you a few. So this was stated in 1994 in the Ford of a book. It was stated by um, a chap in England called Sir Peter Hill Norton. He was a four-star admiral of the British Navy. He was the chairman of the NATO Military Committee. He was on... Britain's Ministry of Defence's Chief Intelligence Staff. Um, he's probably one of the only people in the world to have a direct line to the Queen. 
in the mid-80s. He probably had something like $4 billion worth of hardware underneath him in the form of ships and submarines, nuclear weapons. He started looking into UFOs on the side through military channels. I mean, he was, he's not going to give no for an answer, right? You jump. If someone says, if, if a, if a, if a four-star four admiral asks for answers from his underlings, he gets them. It's as simple as that. And after he assembled enough knowledge on certainly British cases of UFOs that couldn't be explained, he famously stated this. The evidence that there are objects which have been seen in our atmosphere and even on terra firma that cannot be accounted for by, as either man-made objects or as any physical force or effect known to our scientists seems to me to be overwhelming. A large number of sightings have been vouched for by persons whose credentials seem to me to be unimpeachable. It is striking that so many trained observers, such as airline or military pilots, uh, blah, blah, uh, their observations have been in many instances been supported by either technical means, such as radar observations, or more convincingly, by interference with electrical apparatus or, or, or of one sort or another. Okay, that's one example of a quote. You've all heard of the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency? Okay, the first director of the Central Intelligence Agency was a chap called Roscoe Hillencotter. He was a Vice Admiral of the United States Navy and he was the Inspector General of the United States Navy. Extremely, um, uh, a, 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 a sort of person who probably has access to the President maybe once a fortnight. Um, he famously said in 1952, Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about UFOs, but through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe that unknown flying objects are nonsense. Okay. Four-star General Nathan Twining. He was uh, the first um, chairman of the, uh, of the first inauguration of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He, uh, like I said, four-star general. He famously said in 1947. This flying saucer situation is not at all imaginary or seeing too much into natural phenomena. Something really is flying around. The phenomena is something real, not visionary or fictitious. Across the Atlantic, the commanding general of the French Air Forces in the 70s, Lionel Menchassin, said, the number of thoughtful, intelligent, educated people in full possession of their faculties who have seen something and described it grows every day. We can say categorically that mysterious objects have indeed appeared and continue to appear in the sky around us. Jose Carlos Pierre, a Brigadier General, Brazilian Air Force and Chief of General Command of Air Operations for the whole of Brazil, said in 1973, unexplained phenomena in the skies, seemingly piloted or controlled by a high degree of thought and ability, are occurring. I saw more than enough evidence of this while I was Commanding General. Uh, it just goes on. I mean, uh, here's a good one. Ralph Noyes, who was Under Secretary of State, uh, United Kingdom, and Head of the Defence Secretary at uh, Area 8 of the Ministry of Defence in the United Kingdom. He said this in, I think, 1977. Um, this is a good one. It imply, it, it's a good example of where government officials have completely stonewalled the public reporters, even their superiors. Um, quote, I had been convinced for decades past, sitting behind my Whitehall desk, that we had hard evidence for the repeated manifestation of a mysterious something which was able to leave traces on film and radar, to run rings around our most advanced aircraft and to appear to vanish entirely on its own whim and to act with a strong look of intelligence. And I had done absolutely nothing about it except stonewall questions from the public. Right, so if this hasn't got the hallmarkings of a cover-up, or at least something very problematic, even if you just look from a point of view of air safety and air defence around a country, it, 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 you know, it's a serious topic. Whether UFOs exist or not, um, people are seeing things that shouldn't be there. Just for example, this photo. It's a still shot from a 23 second, uh, sorry, a 1 minute and 43 second video. It was taken off the coast of Florida, off the coast of Pine Castle, Florida, in um, early 2014, it's, it's, a, it's a still shot from a forward-looking infrared camera on a FA-18 Super Hornet, which is one of the most advanced combat aircrafts in the world. The pilot's in the front, the weapons officer and navigator is in the back. They chase that object, we have absolutely no idea what it is, 
They chased that object for a pretty significant period of time at quite high altitude over a restricted naval training range where no other aircraft, not business jets, not VIP jets, not airliners, not Cuban transport aircraft, not other military aircraft from other services like the Air Force, nobody should be flying out there. This thing appeared out of nowhere. They chased it. They couldn't keep up, but they did take forward-looking infrared camera footage of it. It turns in the most oddest ways. I, it, all you have to do if you want to type in the word uh, gimbal UFO US Navy, type that into Google, you'll see, you'll, you can see the video, but here's what's weird. You can also hear the audio, the intercom between the pilot and the weapons officer that's sitting behind him. The weapons officer actually says, the weapons officer is looking on another screen off to his side. So they're flying at like 50,000 feet or whatever. Weapons officer is looking at a screen from a camera that looks out the side and the weapons officer says, look, there's a whole fleet of them on my other equipment. Whatever that is and whatever all the other stuff was that was next to them, it shouldn't have been there. It's as simple as that. And we have no idea to this day what it is now. As for military documents, I'll give you an example of, one, this gives an example of a really startling UFO case, and two, it gives the audience, I guess, an example of what a military document looks like. All right, it's pretty dry at first, it looks like a fax, but the implications are astounding. Um, so, Lake Eyre, Ohio, near the city of East Lake, right near one of the biggest nuclear power stations in North America. March 4, 8.30 at night. A message was sent from Coast Guard a Coast Guard station at Fairpoint, Ohio, to the commanding general, uh, sorry, commanding Coast Guard unit headquarters at Detroit, Michigan. The Co a Coast Guard ship had been called to a part of the lake where apparently UFOs, whatever the hell they were, whatever was seen, were being seen by civilians. And then the Coast Guard officials saw the same thing. Okay, so section one. This is, imagine sending this to your superior, quite seriously. You're a Coast Guard officer, imagine sending this to your boss. One, unidentifiable flying objects one quarter of a mile east of the CEI power plant. Two, at 20.35, that's 8.35 local time, this station received a call from a Sheila Baker, address redacted, reporting a large object hovering over the lake and apparently on a slow descent. The object had a white light and was approximately 1.4 uh, miles up. Uh, what my version of it says that? Anyway, um, Bubba was unable to determine how far the, it, it was. This unit sent two crew, crew members to investigate. Before they arrived on site, we received two more calls reporting that the object had apparently dispersed three to five smaller objects that were zipping around rather quickly. These objects had red, green, white and yellow lights on them that strobed intermittently. They also had the ability to stop and hover mid-flight. When Mobile O2... Uh, was go on site, they reported the same activity. So now we've got civilians and, and Coast Guard people saying all the same thing. They watched the objects for approximately one hour before reporting that the large object was almost on the ice. That's of the ice of the lake. They reported the ice was cracking and moving in abnormal amounts as the object came closer to it. The ice was rumbling and the object lit multicoloured lights at each end as it apparently landed. The lights on it went out momentarily and then came back on. They went out again and the rumbling stopped and the ice stopped moving. The smaller objects began hovering over the area where the larger object had landed and after a few minutes they began flying around again. Mobile O2 reported that they appeared to be scouting the area. Mobile O2 reported that one object was moving towards them at a high rate of speed or high speed and low to the ice. Mobile O2 back down the hill uh, they had report, uh, blah, 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 went up the hill, the object was gone. They reported the objects could not be seen, they mean, anymore if they turned on their lights. One of the objects turned on a spotlight where the large object had been, but Mobile O2 could not see anything, and then the object seemed to disappear. Another object approached Mobile O2 approximately 500 yards offshore, about 20 feet above the ice, and began moving closer as Mobile O2 began flashing its headlights. Uh, then it moved off to the west. The crew, this is good. The crew members were unable to identify any of the objects using binoculars and after contacting local police and airports, this unit was unable to identify the objects and recalled Mobile O2. Fancy being a Coast Guard officer and seeing this extraordinary display above the ice right near a sensitive nuclear power station, right? The crazy part about this is I picked this almost at random, this case. We literally have thousands and thousands and thousands of cases like this that read as provocatively and as alarmingly as that. 
And we're not talking from 1942 and 1951. This is 1988. We've got stuff like this from as recently as six months ago. You know? And, yeah. Um, so, the reason why I'm here, every now and again, it's not something I've studied a lot, every now and again, people who claim to have seen or have actually seen um, UFOs or UFO events or uh, whatever have at times, there's probably, I'd say, probably one in 200 cases, witnesses will report that during the sighting or, slight, or, or maybe straight after, weird, I suppose, para, psi, um, mental, life-changing um, effects. So there's been cases where people have seen UFOs and then that night had extremely vivid dreams of their future or their dreams have dug up stuff from their past that they that they'd long should have forgotten. We've had cases where um, people have seen UFOs and then for the next few months in their life um, they've had extraordinarily weird coincidences happen to them. Um, it's... it's it, 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 it takes the UFO topic from a nuts and bolts objects are flying around in the atmosphere and maybe in space. It takes it, it's unsettling, but it takes it to more of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of another realm. It takes it almost to a more, almost esoterical level where both the, not just seeing UFO, but the UFO event has somehow affected their mind or given them, maybe temporarily given them powers that they didn't have before or foresight or, the ability to um, predict the future, maybe. Um, that sort of thing. So, yeah, so that's why I'm here today. Okay. Um, this is a really interesting story. I didn't know what quite to talk about today, and I thought I'd talk about something that's really odd. Anyone who studies parapsychology, um, you know, from more the official side of things, like the history of the topic, what different governments have found about studying, you know, remote viewing and psychics and clairvoyance and, and, and people who claim to look into the future. Governments have done that. China's done it. Japan, Soviet Union back in the days, East Germany, and definitely the United States. Um, so way back in, um, in the 80s, in about 1985, a chap... Okay, so one of the things I do is I approach government agencies and ask them, using the Freedom of Information Act, I ask government agencies to release documents to me. And you can't just write, I want documents about UFOs, have you got me? It's like, it's really complex. You know, you've got to know your stuff. I might write, Dear Air Services Australia, um, I require um, copies um, of the electronically submitted event pilot reporting system between uh, uh, copies of documents between 2022 and 2023 that contain the words unidentified or unidentified flying object or unidentified flying objects, blah, 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 blah. Um, it, it's it's got to be really specific. But anyway, a chap, I mean, this wasn't unique, but a chap in Britain, in Nottingham, started flooding um, uh, various commands right down to squadron and battalion level in the Air Force and Army, right down to flotilla level in the Navy. Um, he started flooding... Yeah, government departments with re very specific, very detailed requests for information about everything from, um, from uh, uh, UFO reports that have been reported by particular military reporting systems. He flooded um, US Space Command or US Air Force Space Command's 21st Space Wing for, uh, for actual literally printout data from telescopes that had actually seen unusual objects in space. Uh, he flooded... Who did he flood? Uh, he, he hit the US Naval Space Command in Delgren, Virginia, and 21st Space Wing at Air Force Base Colorado with, with questions about uh, what they call uncorrelated targets in space, and that is the official term. Um, anyway, the point is, this odd chap, he was very, very successful. Considering he was in Britain, he's not even an American. He flooded the US government with enormous number of requests for information. He also... What's weird about him is... so. He was born in Soviet Armenia, 1952. His name was, uh, was Habib Zadadel. Uh, he fled, his family fled to Iran in 1960. Uh, then they left Iran for Britain illegally in 1979. He changed his name to Henry Zadadel. And then he, that's when in 1985 he started flooding 
uh, the US intelligence community and defence departments for requests of information about UFOs. What was odd about him, though, he was particularly aggressive. He didn't just flood them with written correspondence. Somehow, this chap, he flooded them with uh, phone calls. He somehow, we don't still know how he did it, he won't tell us, he got hold of a, of a classified, confidential Department of Defence phone book, right, which he shouldn't have had. And he started... He started ringing... Uh, you know, a colonels and majors in the US military with all sorts of questions, and most of the time, oh, and he was recording every single phone call, which he shouldn't have been doing, but whatever. Um, he also went through something like eight different aliases. He was also paying for all these phone calls by having his neighbours pay for them because he'd stuffed around with the phone lines in the street. He wasn't convicted of that. He was actually let off on a suspended sentence. When he wasn't doing all this... He was the only person in British history to be ever charged with the smuggling of rare flowers. That is true. He went to the Old Bailey. You can actually see it there. It says something about the magistrate's clerk only. Um, he settled finally on the name Armin Victorian. So that's what I will call him. Armin, because he was originally from Armenia. Victorian, because he'd settled in Victorian England. Um, very, very, very strange guy, but the point was this. He absolutely got out of the US government legally released declassified documents that are extremely important for us today about UFOs being detected in space and reporting systems for um, UFOs when you're in the military and you want to report a UFO over a very classified channel that certainly the public would never know about. He, um, he also he actually, he actually got the instruction. There's a type of um, telescope that the U.S. military use. It's called a GEODSS telescope, Ground Electro Optical Space Surveillance Telescope. He actually had the nerve to ask Eglin Air Force Base in Florida for a copy of the owner's manual for this telescope, and astoundingly, they gave it to him. <laughs> it is absolutely unbelievable how he did this, and many other people couldn't. Um, here's an example, it's actually quite funny. Um, I, I, I won't go into this, but the, someone's... Look, everyone, journalists, aerospace historians, knew that he was using lots and lots of aliases. And later on, I won't go into what this document actually means. It's a Department of Energy. Um, it's a Department of Energy reply letter to a journalist. But uh, if you can believe some of the aliases this chap had, it says on page... Uh, on section one, it says... Uh, uh, copies of documents filled by, quote, Henry Azadadel, also known as Habib Azadadel, Armand Victorian, Julian Phillips, Alan Jones, and, believe it or not, Kasava Natumba. <laughs> he was pretending at one point to be a Ugandan national. It doesn't make sense. The point is, here's, anyway, here's what happened. Um, I'll get to that part in a minute. OK. By the end of the 80s, maybe 1990... He started telling people like me, like researchers and aerospace historians and reporters, that as he had, um, as he had learnt as much as he could from the US government about UFOs, and then reading what was also publicly available in libraries and whatever, he said to a few of people who are now in their 70s, I know them, he said, I've stumbled onto something even bigger, and I shouldn't have, and it's really interesting. And he... Um, what he'd stumbled onto, he'd found that within the US armed forces and within the intelligence community and the law enforcement community, he'd found that there were a group of loosely networked individuals that were really interested in the UFO topic. And they met once every two months, once every three months. They met sometimes at Los Alamos, uh, Los Alamos Laboratories. Sometimes they met at the Defence Intelligence Agency headquarters at Bowling Air Force Base in uh, Virginia. Um, but the point was he'd stumbled across this group of people that were, um, that were, that were extremely interested in UFOs, but they were also interested in something else, and they were actively doing or working with something else. And that's something else... Um, and Victorian, our strange Iranian Brit, he, he realised that what this group of people in the United States, in the government, were studying was both a mixture of UFO, the UFO topic and parapsychology. And so what Armand did then was started flooding the US government with freedom of information requests and archival requests and written correspondence about remote viewing psychic research, 
um, mind controlling, um, scanning coordinates with the mind, telekinesis, maybe even pyrokinesis. That's lighting fires with your mind, apparently. Okay. And um, some of the people he discovered, well, the list, I don't know, it's not particularly important, but the, the list of people that he actually discovered were involved with psychic uh, research, parapsychology research were Christopher Kit Green of the CIA, Commander Scott B. Jones of the US Navy, loaned to the Defence Intelligence Agency, um, a Captain Bob Collins from the US Air Force, Richard Doty, who's an, uh, an, an Office of Air Force Special, Invas uh, Special Investigations cop from Kirkland Air Force Base, um, Dr. Harold Putoff, who was a physicist with the National Security Agency, and so on and so on and so on. So Armin Victorian gets all this information, you know, technical reports and budgetary statements and memorandums and all sorts of stuff about, about the US government's dealings with parapsychology. That's Army Intelligence and Security Command dealings with parapsychology, Department of Energy dealings with parapsychology, the CIA and the NSA's dealing with psychic research. And in probably about 1998, Armin Victorian told people in the UFO community that he's about to publish a book. And they all thought it was going to be about UFOs. But what hit the shelves was one of the strangest front covers, quite unsettling. It was this. So, this came out and it laid out, or certainly the middle section of the book, laid out all the US government's efforts dating back to 1970 in parapsychology research, um, mind control, so-called remote viewing, where someone, a subject, a psychic subject, will sit in a room, not annoyed by anyone, you know, acoustic, acoustically neutral environments, um, certainly no electronics, sit in a room, do a whole bunch of this, and, and come out with some answers that the military are looking for. So, for example, military, some top brass colonel from the army comes in and says to the psychic subject, look, in the next few days, we need you to have some time out, we need you to discover where... Uh, where a, uh, a North Korean army aircraft has crashed. We can't find it with satellite pictures, maybe you can. The subject goes off by himself, has a beer, whatever, does a whole bunch of this, comes out and says, right, I've found it. It's, um, it's at these coordinates, latitude and longitude, with Cartesian north, uh, whatever. Um, it's sitting in a jungle, it's blah, 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 blah. The military go there or send someone there or send their satellites over and bang, it's there. Now, that's extraordinary. If that is true, that is absolutely extraordinary, but that's what this book was about. And they did have success. I'll go into that. Um, now, of those group of people that, um, that were doing parapsychology and remote viewing work, certainly with the US Army, was this bloke here, John B. Alexander. John Beale Alexander was Chief of Advanced Human Technology Office of the U.S. Army's Intelligence and Security Command and Director of Advanced Systems Concept Office at the U.S. Army's Laboratory Command and Manager of Tech Integration with the Army Material Command. Okay, when he found out that this book had been published, he completely hit the roof, right? And what he did, and there's actually, I've never seen it, but I know people who have, I'm going to have to get a copy one day, he, this chap here, he was with Army Intelligence Security Command at Fort Griffiths, I think, in New Hampshire. He um, sent a memoranda to his commanding officer, who I think was Major General Stubline at the time, saying, essentially saying, there's a chap in Britain who's just blown our cover with parapsychology research. Can we do anything about it? Anyway, two weeks after that, um, Victorian, back in England... His house was broken into eight times in six months. He reported every one of them to the police. His phones were bugged. There was other weird stuff happening with his bank accounts. So, so well, I mean, if you, if, unless it's one big coincidence, the, the, certainly the US Army, not to mention presumably the CIA and the FBI and so on, were really uh, unhappy that a book about their parapsychology and, you know, to, maybe to a lesser extent, UFO interests had actually hit the book stands. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I'll read you some of the stuff from this book. It's, it's um, where is it? One section here. Um, uh, it is a little complicated. One of the psychic remote viewers was a chap called Ingo Swan, and he was with the CIA. He, this is weird. Some of the results of RV experiments were startling. 
On a Nightline TV show on the 28th of November 1995, a CIA representative known only as Norm, a former CIA technical advisor to John Mahan, uh, Deputy Director, uh, on the use of remote viewing programs in the mid-80s stated, quote, well, if it isn't the eight martini, sorry, if it is the eight martini results you want to talk about, I won't talk about them. Now, eight martini results was an in-house CIA term for remote viewing data so good that it cracked everyone's sense of reality. On the same program, Robert Gates, the ex-director of the CIA, added that remote viewing had a promising future. Okay, here's where things get weird. Ingo Swan, he was a psychic, apparently. Uh, Ingo Swan has provided an account of one such eight martini result, which took place between 75 and 76. He was asked to remote view a Soviet submarines. According to Swan, there was all sorts of this, uh, all sorts of this two and three, uh, all, uh, all sorts of brass, that means top brass, top military officers, sitting there, and Putov, it's a, he's a physicist, was on my left, and this two or three star general was on my right, and I was fussing away as they gave me the coordinates. This is one of those big tests, uh, big test things that went on with, the, uh, with witnesses in the room and the room was filled. And so I was doing my remote viewing bugaloo. So it means he's trying to picture something on the other side of the world just with his mind that is happening in real time. And finally, I came across something that stopped me in my tracks and I looked and said, oh, my God. So I whispered over to Hal's ear and said, Hal, I don't know what to do. I think that this submarine has shot down a UFO or the UFO fired on her. What should I do? Putoff was as pale as anything, you know, and he looked at me and whispered, oh Christ, it's your show, you do what you want, you think you should do. So I sketched out the picture of this UFO and this top brass sitting by, uh, by my right side grabbed it and said, what's that, Mr Swan? I said, sir, I think it's rather obvious what it is. He took that piece of paper, he stood up, and when he stood up, everyone else stood up except me and Putoff and walked out the room and all the, so did the others, blah, blah, blah. So Putoff and I went back to the hotel and said, oh Christ, we've blown the whole program. So we went out, got drunk on margaritas and things like that and went back. Three days later, Putoff got a call. This would have been from the, gen uh, the senior officers. They called and said, OK, how much money do you want? So they were so impressed. Obviously, Ingo Swan, with just merely his mind, had found the Soviet submarine and apparently found that it was under fire or firing upon an unidentified flying object. Either way... Um, People who, the three and four star generals were impressed. Um, another example, this is weird. Okay. Imagine you give someone the coordinates, north, south, east, west, I don't know, a latitude and longitude. If I just gave you a coordinates on Earth somewhere, you might have some vague idea that it's over Asia or it's in the Indian Ocean or something like that, but you're not going to be able to do this. One of the sub-programs within the parapsychology work of the US government, it was called ScanGate. ScanGate, scanning by coordinate, started on 29th of May 1973 and was completed in 1975. It sent a chilling message to the military and intelligence chiefs. When Ingo Swan made his first attempts at remote viewing a site, having only been given its, it says his, it should say its, coordinates, he had startling results. He described the features of a small French-administered island of Kuaglin in the southern Indian Ocean, including the layout of buildings and what appeared to be a joint French-Soviet meteorological research station. He even drew a passable map of the island. Now... You can see the obvious applications for this. Imagine you're trying to work out where your enemy's planes have all been hidden in hangars or where some submarine, some Chinese submarine, sunk underneath the waters heading for your, for your wider navy. Um, and your traditional intelligence methods like um, satellite imaging and acoustical um, microphoning underneath the water, spies, they're not working. So you fall back on people with apparent psychic abilities. Uh, these programs, there was lots and lots of actual programs within the CIA, DIA, Army, um, Department of Energy, and they all had varying degrees of success. What was weird was sometimes so-called psychics were unable to actually perform very well at all, and then sometimes they were able to perform extremely well. And, you know, the statistical aberrations were... were but from a mathematical and statistical point of view... Um, it was enough to keep 
going and funding projects like this. The problem is they didn't understand how it worked. They don't... The, 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 the people paying, paying for all this had no idea how these so-called psychics were actually able to pull these sort of um, mean feats off, being able to see things through time and space that it should be normally completely impossible. Um, there was also... We do know now that there's some... some um, people within the military were actually quite scared of all this. A lot of people in the US military are going to be Baptists and Pentecostals and so on. And some, I believe, some found that, the, you know, you'd say, in an extreme term, work of the devil. Um, what do we got next? Okay, yeah. Here's some government documents that I mean, very, very few people have seen these. Most people aren't interested in this stuff. Um, very, very few people have seen these. Um, they're very hard to get. But over the years, um, the CIA particularly has released tens of thousands of pages of documents on parapsychology. Absolutely heaps. Some of them are simply copies of newspaper articles from the Eastern Bloc, you know, East Germany and so on. Some of them are right through to extremely provocative um, uh, so, okay, for example, there was one particular program called Progra uh, Program Sunstreak. It was run by the Defence Intelligence Agency and it tasked so-called psychics to, um, to be able to see things on the other side of the world and blah, blah, blah. The usual, okay, so here, um, there was a briefing obviously given by the people running the parapsychology program gave a briefing to... Um, some technical and scientific staff uh, who were interested in the topic. It says here, Project Sunstreak deals with the use of psychoenergetics in the collection of intelligence information. Psychoenergetics is defined, uh, is defined as shown here and is broadly subdivided into two classes. Mental effects on the physical world, so telekinesis, lifting up a spoon with my mind, whatever, uh, or, and two, purely mental collection of information. Um, the actual slide for the people who were sitting there right back in 1973, probably in military uniforms, says the process which, by which an individual may physically interact with objects, locations, organisms or events. Psychokinesis, um, physical actions performed by mental powers, ESP or extrasensory perception, telepathy and remote viewing, perceptions which cannot be explained by known sensory means. They go forward with something that I mentioned before, remote viewing. Remote viewing is an SRI. SRI is a Stanford Research Institute. It's a it's a it's a it's an institute. It's a quasi private institute in the United States, and it has offices around the world. Remote viewing is an SIR coined term. The definition is shown here. Remote viewing is defined as the acquisition and description by mental means of information blocked by ordinary perception of distance, shielding, and time. So remember, these are this 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 isn't some area. I mean. The, it's not every day you see the world's most powerful um, government actually admitting that this stuff, that they're actually researching this stuff, you know? OK, uh, what are we up to? Look at this. Psychic impressions included much detailed, accurate information. This is where things get good. Some of which was previously unreported about, and this is still classified, where you see black ink. That, to this day, even though these documents are from the 70s, that is not for your eyes. CIA, you can see it right up the top, it says approved for release 2000, year 2000, 8th of the 8th. CIA, and that's the n name of the document, right up the top. Even now, this stuff's 50 years old, and yet it's still too sensitive uh, for the American taxpayer, apparently. Um, uh, these psychic impressions were confirmed by human intelligence, uh, I mean, which means human intelligence, and by national technical sources. So, uh, 1970s, early attempts by the Department of Defence bullet point one, used experienced experimenters Hal Putoff and Russell Targ quote, uh, point two used proven gifted subjects Pat Price, Patrick Price and Ingo Swan, three, gained detailed information, this is interesting so, so uh, Pat Price and Ingo Swan have sat there in a room in Washington DC and been asked to look at a particular factory in the Soviet Union and they apparently gained detailed information about Soviet research and development facility at semi I can't even read that. 
1978, the Army's Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence concluded that there was sufficient evidence to warrant the development of a comprehensive program to explore intelligence collection applications of psychoenergetics. The Army Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence cancelled the Gondolewish effort, that's just a code name for a particular program, placed a complete security envelope over the Army's interest in, interest in psychoenergetics, that means make it more classified, and hopefully Congress have no idea about what's going on, and implemented a new program directed towards intelligence collection and remote viewing. Now, this is good. The United States Navy plane went missing in 1979. On the 4th of September 1979, Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence asked INSCOM, that's Intelligence and Security Man, US Army, to locate a missing Navy aircraft. This is with some of the mind, right? Hence, the first INSCOM grill flame, that was the name of the new program, operational remote viewing took place. First mission was tasked on the 4th of September 1979 to locate a missing Navy aircraft. Now, could the psychic actually pull it off? In this in initial session, the remote viewer located the missing aircraft within 15 miles of where it had crashed. First mission task and blah, 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 locate missing aircraft. Aircraft was located physically within 15 miles of actual crash shot. So that means with someone's mere mental powers, they were apparently able to locate a plane somewhere on Earth's surface. And, yeah, it's weird. Um, this just shows how far this went, right? Like, the number of agencies were involved in this. Parapsychology research. This memorandum of understanding also formalised a cooperation among active grill flame players and uh, other than the D Defence Intelligence Agency and Intelligence and Security Command. Uh, the various uh, government departments who were involved, interested, funding, uh, um, 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 utilising parapsychology or remote viewing work were the Secretary of the Army, Army Council General Counsel, the Assistant Surgeon General for Medical Research and Development, the Vice Chief of Staff for the Army, the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, the United States Navy, and the last section still to this day is classified. We keep asking, please lift these redactions. We keep writing to the CIA and say, please lift these redactions. These documents are from 1973. And apparently what's beneath the black writing is too sensitive for your eyes or mine Okay, moving to 1985, this is, this is interesting. It gets a bit academic, it's what I'm interested in. Um, another program, in para, another parapsychology program was called the Centre Lane Program. And it was, um, it, was, it was briefed or revealed to the Director of the Defence Intelligence Agency in 1985. It provides a chronological list of what uh, the DIA and the Army had been doing in the last 10 years, so from about 75 to 85. <sighs> Central line information papers for the Director of the Defence Intelligence Agency. Remember the Director of the Defence Intelligence Agency is only one spot below the President, OK? 7th of March, 85. You'll notice here at the bottom, it's getting sensitive now. Warning notice, Central Lane Special Access Program restrict, restrict dissemination to those with verified access to Category 4. I don't know what Category 4. Sensitive intel, intelligence sources and methods involved, not releasable to foreign nationals, and apparently only two copies were made of this particular log. And I'll just get through this quickly. So... Um, this, this absolutely proves, certainly to me, that a very large number of people within the US governmental apparatus were being told about, were being asked to fund, were benefiting from parapsychology research. Point down, 13th of July 1978, um, establishment of Project Real Flame. The Assistant Chief of Staff of the Army directed all Army parapsychology and remote viewing research, experiments, applications, etc., to be protected by unclassified nickname Grill Flame. So the classified nickname, we still don't know what it is now. An unclassified nickname is something that you might accidentally... You, you say that in the hallway at the CIA or at the DIA, so it doesn't matter if anyone actually overhears you, but the real name is completely, completely off limits. October 78, Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence tasked INSCOM to develop to actually finally actually go on with the parapsychology program. Headquarters INSCOM never received written tasking, blah, 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 blah. Um, okay, 
December 1978 to 79, selection of remote viewers and, interview, and interviewers. Of the, this, is, this is how you find a psychic, apparently. Of the 251 personnel considered for grill flame, 117 were interviewed and six individuals were actually selected for training. That's trained them how to be psychic warriors, whatever. It's pretty amazing stuff. Right down the bottom, 4th of, uh, 4th of September, the first, as we know before from the missing naval aircraft, first operational remote viewing session took place. A missing aircraft was located within 15 nautical miles radius of its down location. Um, by 1980, the Under Secretary of the Army, um, fourth down from the President, um, was briefed. Someone below that, someone where the name is redacted, within the CIA. I suspect it would be the Director of Science and Technical Appropriations of the CIA. He or she was also brief. Right down the bottom on the 1st of February, the Secretary of the Army approved the continuation of, of Grill Flame, that's the code name, activity. So parapsychology is continuing, is continuing into 1982. This one's good. This, this shocked me. 5th of August, 1982. Lieutenant General Frower was briefed on parapsychology. Now, in the United States Armed Forces, the highest rank you can attain is a four-star general. That's, it, the word is general. Um, the second highest rank you can get is a lieutenant general. That's a three-star. Typically, a lieutenant general will have underneath them anywhere between $500 million and $20 billion budget annual, annually, a year. Imagine you're a flag officer, a lieutenant general, Lieutenant General Flower, Frower, you're a flag officer. That means everywhere you go in a limousine, um, you're going to have flags on the front and you're going to have six security staff in front and six at the back. Okay, you're running a $20 billion agency. It literally, he was, uh, Lieutenant General Flower was running the National Security Agency, which to this day is still the biggest intelligence agency in the whole world, right? He's the sort of person who has, probably has meetings that last three minutes at a time. He would be... So busy, and yet someone found it appropriate to... to uh, someone, someone obviously within the parapsychology program was so convinced that it was the real deal that they actually went to um, the director of the NSA, Lieutenant General, and um, briefed him on it. And he was probably quite startled. You just don't see this every day. Down at 19th of January, the Honourable Richard Delura, um, Under Secretary of Defence, signs a memorandum allowing Program 6... I don't know what that means. Resources to be used to maintain the current INSCOM central aim capability. So that means we're continuing on with parapsychology research. This was so highly classified because if it was the real deal, if people, if certain people, psychics, could actually see things on the other side of their world with their minds or actually interfere with physical objects. Imagine going to the casino with what you could do. Imagine that. Just imagine that. And the, obviously... Obviously, top scientific and technical people within, within, within the military ecosystem of the US government are going to be falling over themselves to get access to um, individuals that can do things that should be beyond human capability completely. Um, yeah, so... Um, I, I, yeah, I haven't read about this stuff for 20 years, and I started a few weeks ago, and um, it's, it, is, it is quite stunning. I mean, it's not every day you see, um, you know, a, a release government documents that actually admit to essentially mind control and ESP and clairvoyancy and so on. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I thought I would show you, something that there's probably no chance you would have seen otherwise. Thank you. Oh, 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 yeah, that. Yeah, I forgot about that. Oh, my knee's sore. Yeah, anyone, whatever. Yeah, anyone. Sorry? Defence Intelligence Agency, Bowling Air Force, Bryce, West Virginia. A Defence Intelligence Agency acts in, co in cahoots with the CIA. What it is, Defence Intelligence Agency... Is, is an agency, it's 25,000 staff, I think it's got something like $13 billion budget a year. What it does is, 
It assesses new foreign weapons systems. It assesses what enemy countries may be trying to develop on the battlefield. It assesses um, like the technical abilities of foreign governments to acquire technology from suspect sources. Um, and even, it even studies how, say, a foreign military, say Panama's army, may fund itself through, say, drug trafficking and stuff like that. It's kind of like an all-source... <coughs> it's an all-source... It's an all-source agency that basically assesses foreign capabilities on the battlefield, in space. I guess it's got a cyber role now. Um, it, works, it works very closely with the Army, Air Force and Navy on intelligence dissemination, um, the dissemination of information rapidly for battlefield commanders. So it's kind of like an administrative, an administrative version of what you would see at... at, at um, yeah, it, it's sort of hard to explain. It, it's, it's, it, but yeah, it works very clearly, closely in conjunction with the CIA. It's a very big organisation. Next. Yep. Uh, 1966 Westall. Oh yeah, yeah. I knew this would come up. Do you have any additional information other than what's known or what's seen? Um, well, I will tell you this. Something definitely happened. Like we, I know a lot about it. There's two possibilities. There's only two possibilities. Either it was an absolute Absolute bona fide UFO case, right? Absolutely no question about that. Or it was a stray or missing um, man-made object that was highly classified. So, so something like a very, very early drone or a pair of drones, something like, something like a very early pair of drones that should never have been flying over a populated area, um, we look. There's there's a lot of evidence to say either way. Something definitely happened. There's, I don't have any other than what you can generally read on on the internet. I do, I've never person. I know a bit about it, but I've never personally studied. I've never interviewed witnesses. I've got folders full of material, early newspaper articles, um, maps of the area, that sort of thing. I've never personally studied it that much. Just one other question. Uh, there seems to be some kind of correlation with UFO sightings and uh, nuclear plants. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, big time. Yeah, it's 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 shocking. I mean, the 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 number of the number of um, provocative, very very evidence backed, startling close up UFO um, intrusions or, or or cases where unidentified flying objects have appeared over nuclear power stations, nuclear research facilities, and particularly bases or storage facilities that keep nuclear weapons, physically keep them, is absolutely unbelievable. The, 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 you could pick, I could pick any year at all and give you, you know, multiple examples of where unidentified something in the atmosphere, intrusive, um, unannounced, unidentified craft, objects, phenomena have appeared near nuclear weapons bases, over ships that are, ha that, that are, that are, that are, that are carrying nuclear bombs, um, it is, it is an extremely high correlation, and it was actually found extremely early on. The first person to actually um, note the correlation was a bloke called Edward. It was a U.S. Air Force, a U.S. Air Force Captain Edward J. Rappelt, and he went to his superior, um, who was I think Aaron J. Boggs Major, who went to his superior, who was uh, Van, uh, Hoyt Vandenberg, who was Chief of the Air Staff, 947, and basically Edward Rappelt said. There's a massive correlation of UFO sightings above our nuclear facilities, and we don't know what's going on. If it's the Soviets, we're in big trouble. And and uh, it was it was it was so sensitive and it was so alarming. Even in 19, even in even right back then, it was so alarming that they that that that, that security guards at nuclear sites were specifically ordered to look out for UFOs. You can actually find documents. The Ground Observers Corps. Um, site security people, disaster preparedness people, nuclear scientists were all were all given the go ahead to keep a good eye out for unusual aircraft uh, right above your nuclear facilities. It's been going on for a very long time, all over the world. Next. Yep. What got you interested in this topic? Two, two things. My dad was in the. Can you the for oh, um, what got me interested in the topic? Two things. So, off the coast of a, uh, you might well, off the coast of Melbourne in 1978. Um, it was 21st of um, uh, 21st of uh, October, I think. Yeah, 21st of October 1978. Some of you might know that a pilot went missing. Frederick Valentik, his name was. He went missing 
of, he, he was flying a single engine Cessna from Moorabbin Air, Air, from Moorabbin Air, Air Base over Cape Otway um, towards King Island. And he never made it. He just completely vanished. But the um, Australian Transport Safety Bureau, back then it was called Bureau of Air Safety Investigation, um, was, uh, was pushed into releasing a transcript of his final 12 minutes of flight. So what happened was, he's flying at 7.30 7 at night, perfect weather, I think it was a Thursday night, um, Frederick Valentik is flying by himself to King Island. And then he started saying down the radio to Melbourne Airport, Tullamarine, to air traffic controller Steve Roby, he's saying, look, I'm being uh, shadowed by an object, uh, there's a strange object out here, um, it's silver on the outside, uh, blah, 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 blah. It's orbiting above me. His last words were, his last words down the radio were, uh, Melbourne, that object is, oh, sorry, uh, Melbourne, that craft is orbiting on top of me again. It's orbiting and it's not an aircraft. And then he completely disappeared <coughs> off the face of the earth. Now, every now and again, this case, when I was a child, this case would come up on The Current Affair and in magazines and in the newspaper, and that's, that's one reason I got interested in the UFO topic, because this mystery has still never been solved. We've never found the plane. No one knows what was out there with him. There was no Air, Air Force chartered flights in the area. There was no other aircraft. It's an absolute massive mystery, and, no, and the, the family is still wanting answers, even now. That's one thing that got me involved. But the other thing was my dad was in the Army, and he was in a very, very technical role in the army, and he's got a very scientific mind. Before I was born, 1975, he was driving between Melbourne and Sydney, or Sydney to Melbourne, and he saw a, a object in the sky, it was middle of the night, an incredibly bright object in the sky coming towards him. He thought it was a train headlight and realised it was way too high up. Um, uh, it was insanely bright, like blindingly bright. Then it turned off. Then it was behind him and it shone a light directly on his car, so he completely floored it all the way to Melbourne. He can't solve the case. He doesn't know what it was. We know it wasn't a helicopter. He wound down his windows to listen to the distinctive sound of rotor blades. There was nothing there. Um, he's, uh, he's tried. He's, he's an extremely scientific person. He's tried to figure out what it is, and he can't. There's the two things that got me involved. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Well, what's your take on the current disclosure push and all the hearings that are going on? Yeah, it's good. Um, 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 I, I, the, being trying to keep, but see, okay. The, unfortunately, the very agencies that have the best UFO data, they are the North American Aerospace Defence Command and the Air Force Space Command. They, um, oh, how can I explain this? Yeah, there is a there is a huge movement in officialdom around the world to be much more open about UFO cases, to share data between scientists more readily, to analyse photographs without immediately assuming that they are hoaxes and so on. Um, I think there's a long way to go. The, the, uh, it's, it's, it's really good. It's better than we've had before. Like we've, the, like we've, we've had research, we've had situations where we've been completely stonewalled, ridiculed by the very people who are now saying, oh, wow, maybe we should wake up. Like, you know, like it, it was bound to happen one day. I just didn't think it would be yet. Yep. Yep. What do you think you're the work of Doug Stephen Greer? Um, oh, boy. Um, his very, very early work was absolutely fantastic. For those that don't know, Stephen Greer is a medical doctor um, from North Carolina who has an, had an interest, has an interest in the UFO topic. And with some funding behind him, he got a, seri he got a, a very large number of UFO witnesses, pilots, air traffic controllers, um, various other technical experts, um, astrophysicists, rocket designers and so on, to basically appear at a press conference. In, it was September 21, 2001. And basically, basically what Stephen Greer did at the start was really good. So he made the topic very briefly appear to be not so kooky. The problem is, since then, Greer has become money hungry. Um, he is um, extremely hard to work with. Oh, I've never actually worked with him, but I know him. I, mean, I have emailed him a bit. But no, I mean, it, it, his work was good at the start. Great. I don't, I don't, I take no notice of him now. I'm just a general question. Um, historically, when did like the UFO <laughs> this is this is yeah it's interesting um, 
we've got yeah if anyone's ever read the bible I guess it's the book of Ezekiel there's um, this I actually haven't read this but in in the book of Ezekiel which was written I guess BC um, Ezekiel discusses unidentified flying objects if you if how can I explain this if you read what he is writing in a certain way you could see them as flying saucers um, this has been going on for so long we've seen there's there's a there's there's very, you know how sometimes you hear about a case where um, there might be some painting uncovered in a church and the painting is like 500 years old? Or, um, I mean, there's, 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 there's certainly churches around the world, grottos and, and churches around the world where, where, where artists have put, where artists have, 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 have painted scenes that clearly to me, clearly to me, so, show something flying in the sky. That, I mean, a, a good example, Nuremberg in, I think, 1516, Nuremberg over Germany, something was flying in the skies over New... So many people, theologians and, and, and horse and cart people and town criers and, and bishops and everyone else saw a fantastic aerial display of objects over their city right back in 15-something, and you certainly can't blame that on planes and helicopters, we hadn't even invented hot air balloons then. All we had invented that went to the sky was gunpowder, and that was China. So, the, like, the, the, this, this has been going on for an incredibly long time. Yep. One more question? Yep. Um, have you followed the Chris Bledsoe... Yeah, I haven't. I, haven't. I start, people often ask me things like that. I uh, yeah, I haven't. Um, I haven't at all. I I haven't. I I literally focus solely on declassified documents, um, historical UFO cases, um, um, yeah, pilot encounters, so forth. But I know who you're talking about. I've never studied. Never. What's interesting is John B. Alexander, that colonel. Yeah. He's become good friends. He's oh, has he? I didn't know that. He wrote one, um, he's one person who wrote forward. So he, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, the new book, yeah. I knew he's it. had, um, the reason I brought him up is it seems that he's had more um, interest from any of his government and intel um, officials yeah. than anybody before, yeah. like from Pentagon. Yeah, it'd be Department of Defence and the CIA. Um, yeah. Yeah, I had heard that. I've never followed it. It's almost like sometimes I'm 20 years behind. I'm still getting through. Yeah, I, I didn't know John B. Alexander knew him. John B. Alexander's like 85 now. Yeah, I know. Jim Simon. Yep, he's a CIA scientist. Yeah, yeah. So yep. he's like I've emailed. I think I've emailed with him. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's just like really, really interesting the sort of people. And he's, you know, I like to become friends with, um, is it Edgar Mitchell? Edgar Mitchell, the, um, Astronaut, yeah. yeah. It was the last person to land on the moon. Um, and he spent time at the Monroe Institute yeah. with, with Puthoff. Yep, hell. Um, yep. So I think there's... Oh, there might be something there. I mean, there has to be. They, they're not going to... Yeah. It'll be... It'll be... Yeah, his claims will be probably a lot stronger than the average. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's cool. I've... My legs are sore, so... All right. Thank you very much.